Hello again everyone and welcome back to my channel. I've just finished building a brand new virtualization server. It's this guy right here. It's running Proxmox and it runs at just 50 watts on average, which is crazy. And that was the goal. I wanted to build a low power virtualization host and I've definitely accomplished that. In this video, I'm going to talk about the parts that I decided to go with. I'll show the build process and then you'll see it in action. All right, so before we get started, I wanted to give you guys some information regarding the motherboard that I decided to go with for this build. And here it is right here. This is the model number. I'm not going to read off that entire model number, but there will be a link to this page below in the description. And there's also going to be links to other components down there as well. But the most important takeaway here is that this is rated to run at up to 55 watts and the CPU is built in. So basically when you don't count the RAM and the hard drives or peripherals that you'll likely add to something like this, it's actually a very low rating for power usage. And the CPU that's built in is this one right here. It's an AMD Epic 3251. And that has eight cores and 16 threads. So I think that can more than handle the VMs that I plan on running on this server. And it is replacing a Dell PowerEdge R610, and the CPU that's currently in there is this one right here, the Intel Xeon L5630, and a link to this page will also be down below as well. And you can see some information regarding this processor. It actually has fewer cores and fewer threads. However, the current server does have two of these, so when it comes to the number of threads, it does equal out to be the same. But I did also pull up a comparison page right here so we can compare the two side by side. On the left, we have the AMD Epic processor. That's the new one again. And then on the right, we have the current server that it's replacing. And we can see that it's actually going to be, well, it's probably going to be a lot faster because look at the numbers here. The AMD Epic 3251 does appear to be orders of magnitude better than the L5630. And that's amazing to me because I was thinking with the low power usage, I mean, keep in mind that yes, it does appear to have a higher power usage rating here, but the overall motherboard in its entirety is rated up to 55 watts, which is still going to beat this guy. I was expecting that this was actually going to be somewhat of a downgrade and I was okay with that because I have never been at a point where I really maxed out even this. So I think maybe this is also overkill for me as well because, I mean, I'm mainly the only person that uses the server rack anyway. So I think that this is actually going to be faster when I was actually expecting it to be, well, like I said, a little bit of a downgrade. The clock speed is higher. The turbo speed is higher. The number of physical cores is higher, but again, when you've added up all the threads, it'll equal out to the same. And then you also have a single thread rating of 1440 versus 935. And the CPU mark is more than double. That's actually really awesome. So I'm itching to get this thing built. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to switch the camera. I'll get everything ready. I'll show you all the components that are going to go inside this new server, and then we'll go ahead and build it. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at all of the parts that are going to go into this new server build. I can't wait to put this together. Now, first of all, obviously we need a chassis, a case, we need something to put the parts in. And for that, I have this iStar USA D214 case. And I'll try to get it in frame here so you guys can see it better. Now this one is very, very basic, as you can see. It's not the most beautiful thing you've ever seen, but I think it'll get the job done. Then in the back, we have two little thumb screws here. And with the top cover removed, you can clearly see that it is definitely a generic case. But I think for this project, this is all I need. I'll put this aside for now. So I'm going to show you guys the motherboard in just a moment, but I'll get the smaller items out of the way first. And right here, I have two sticks of RAM. 
by Crucial, DDR4. Each one is 32 gigs, so this will give me obviously a total of 64. And I actually ordered four of these, but only two of them have arrived so far. Amazon's just slow to ship things nowadays for some reason I can't really understand. But I think 64 gigs is more than enough to get me started. So when it comes to storage, I have these two SSDs right here, both by Samsung. They're 512 gigabytes, which should be more than enough storage for my needs. I decided to reuse these from the old build because I wanted to use the extra money for, you know, memory, which I kind of feel like is way more important for this kind of use case. And if you're curious of the model number, these drives are both the 850 Pro, so I think I'll have more than enough storage. An SSD back storage will definitely make this a very fast server. And for the power supply, I decided to go with this unit right here. Just like my earlier FreeNAS build, this is from Antec. It's the exact same power supply. 380 watts with 88% max efficiency is an 80 plus bronze power supply. I mean, it's not modular, so I know it could be better, but I think it's going to be just fine for what I need. It's definitely running very well in my FreeNAS server, which I built in a previous video. So I decided to go with the same one in this build as well. For the motherboard, I've decided to again go with Super Micro, just like I did with the FreeNAS build in my earlier video. This one though is a little bit more expensive than that one because I wanted to have more cores and more CPU horsepower because again, this is a virtualization server. I'm definitely going to need the extra power boost. You'll see the model number of this board on the screen and the CPU is actually built in. It's an AMD Epic 3251 eight core CPU and it has 16 threads. And I think that'll work just fine for me because I don't have a ton of virtual machines. And this is actually a pretty powerful board. And this motherboard is rated to run up to about 55 watts. So the power usage is definitely going to be lower than the model that it's replacing. In fact, let's go ahead and get it unboxed. Let's see what's inside. So we have a packing list. And I'll go ahead and put that aside. And right here we basically get some information about the board layout so I know where to put the pins and everything. Basically exactly what you would expect to find in a super micro box. IO shield. Of course we have a plethora of cables here so I think I'll definitely have enough for what I need. Put those aside and let's check out the actual motherboard. And yes, it is a little small. This is a mini ITX motherboard. And here it is in all of its glory. Check this thing out. There's no fan on here. There is a model that does include a fan, but I wanted one that was quiet. I don't really want my server rack to be very loud, so that was a very important factor for me. But this is the board that I'll be putting in the case. In fact, let's go ahead and do that right now. So next, I'm going to need to inspect the I.O. board and punch out each of the metal covers for all of the ports that I'll end up using. And it's important not to punch them all out because it appears that they're using a uniform I.O. board for multiple different motherboards. So if you punch them all out, you're going to let unnecessary air into the case. So only punch out the ones you actually need. I'll go ahead and take care of that right now. And here's the I.O. board right here with everything punched out. So I'll go ahead and put it in the case. Just like so. Then I'll get these wires out of the way. I'll definitely need these later. And 
And let's take another look at the motherboard before I put it in the case. Here it is again. And I want to show you guys the ports that are on the back. As you can see, we have uh, multiple Ethernet ports here, VGA, USB 3, basically exactly what you would expect from a server motherboard. And the standoffs I need are already on the case itself, so I don't need to do anything there. I should be able to just go ahead and put it in the case. Make sure it's lined up, and it is. And there we go. And next I'll use my patented screwdriver to go ahead and tighten the board down onto the case. Next, I'm going to go ahead and install the RAM. And since I only have two modules right now, I need to put these in slots A2 and B2. Okay, so far so good. We have these cables right here that need to be installed. This is obviously USB, that's what it says on the cable. And I'll worry about cable management later, but I want to get these plugged in. Of course we have our front panel connectors right here, so let's go ahead and get these installed. So all the cables are connected, at least in terms of the front panel connectors. I still need to add a fan and then also install a power supply. So for the fan, I have this cheap fan from Best Buy right here. I forgot to show you at the beginning, but it's about $5. It's a very quiet fan. I think it'll do the job just nicely. So I'll go ahead and get that installed. Okay, I should be able to access this little Fan overlay, whatever you want to call it, here in the front of the case, four more screws. Definitely not the most modular case I've ever used. So I've installed the fan onto this plate, and I'm simply going to put it back into the case. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and install the power supply. So here's the power supply right here. This is what's going in the case. I've gone ahead and unboxed it. There's nothing really amazing about this. You'll notice that there's no fan on either side. The fan is right here. There's really not much room for a fan in this case. There is a fan vent though, so you can put a power supply in this case that has a fan. You just can't set anything on top of it. Now. On my end, I probably will want to stack something on top of it, so I bought this power supply. And again, there's no fan, so I won't need to worry about anything being blocked. Anyway, I'll go ahead and fit it into the case. Okay, so let's go ahead and attach the cables and we should be pretty close to done. Okay, so for the most part, everything is done. I obviously have to do a little bit more work with the cable management because, well, it's a complete disaster. But with this case and a non-modular power supply, there's only so much I can do. Okay, so I almost forgot, guys, something very important. This motherboard cable right here is obviously necessary. Initially, I thought that it wasn't because there's nothing on the motherboard anywhere that matches up to this cable. So I was thinking because it's low power, maybe it doesn't need it. Well, it definitely does. It uses this little attachment right here that comes with the motherboard. 
So essentially all we do is just attach these two cables together. Make sure they're nice and snug. And then this little cable right here actually plugs into the motherboard and it goes right here. I don't know if I can get that in the frame. I'm going to try, but there's this little tiny little connector right here in front of my finger. You can barely see it. So that one right there. And I'm going to carefully just plug this in. And there you go. Now I'm going to uh, fix the cable management here. I know it's a disaster, but I'll take care of that off camera. But basically everything is all set. We're ready to power on this server. For now, let's go ahead and just put the side panel back on. And I'm going to power this thing on and see if it's actually working. All right, so the server has been racked and it's ready to go. I've already powered it on. And what I'm going to do right now is connect to the IPMI interface so we can go ahead and set up Proxmox. So let's get started. My DHCP server registers all the host names in DNS, so I should be able to hit the IPMI interface by typing in the host name that I gave it in my PFSense server. And that is vm-host-1-ipmi.homenetwork.io. Let's see if this works. And I have a login screen here, so, so far so good. Actually, off camera, I've gone ahead and configured the IPMI interface already. I've changed the username and the password. And the username actually defaults to admin in all caps. And that's also the same with the password as well. That should also be admin in all caps, but not in my case. Before I even customized the username and the password, it actually defaulted to a completely different password. There was a sticker on the motherboard that actually had the password written on it. So just keep that in mind. If you buy this motherboard, you should look at the motherboard. If you have a sticker like I did, it'll have the password on there. And that's the password you'll need to use. But I, I've gone ahead and customized this. I've actually called my user Velociraptor. Why? Well, because they can open doors. Why not? And then the password, I'll type that in. And here we are on the IPMI interface. And this is really cool because it actually allows me to remotely manage the server without even having to get out of the chair. In fact, I don't even need to plug in a flash drive to install Proxmox. If I go to virtual media and then CD-ROM image, you'll see that I actually have an ISO image mounted. And this is the server right here that the ISO image is stored on. This is the very same FreeNAS server that I set up in my previous video. And then this is the path to the share and the ISO right here. So basically what I've done is I've saved the Proxmox ISO image. I've shortened the name to just pve.iso. I've stored it in my images share on this server. And then I mounted it off camera in this interface right here. I just wanted to make sure that it's working. And what that allows me to do is go to remote control and then I can go to the IKVM right here. And then on this screen, I'll click on this IKVM HTML5 button, and that should give me, and it does, a look at what's on the screen on the server right now. Under options, I can configure the zoom, so I can go to full screen mode, for example, which doesn't seem to help me all that much, does it? But I can go to preference, then I can actually increase the scaling. Let's just do maybe about 70%, and um, I'll make that a bit larger here. And you can see right here that I'm on the boot screen. It's asking me to select a boot device. So off camera, I basically pressed F11 through the virtual console to make sure that it opened the boot menu. And then down here, the third option is a virtual CD-ROM drive. And that's actually the CD-ROM drive or the virtual CD-ROM drive that has that ISO image attached. So all I should need to do is press enter and it should boot right from that ISO image. And here we have the Proxmox boot screen, and maybe I need to lower the zoom a bit here. It's actually quite large. 
I'll press enter to install Proxmox and this will be the same as if I was actually standing in front of the server with a keyboard. And now it's starting up. So at this point in the installer we have the end user license agreement that I'm going to skip down here and agree to so hopefully I'm not signing my life away or anything like that. Now I do notice an issue with the IKVM sometimes where the mouse doesn't work as it's not working now and when that happens I can lower the zoom level here so let me try that I'll go down to let's say 60% and sure enough, that seems to have fixed it, although it's really hard to see. Then here on the second screen of the installer, it's going to ask us which hard drive we would like to install Proxmox on. And if you recall, I have two. They're both Samsung SSDs. In my case, I'm only going to install Proxmox on the very first SSD. Now we do have other options though. If I click options just to show you what we have available, and if I drop down here, we actually have ZFS options as well. If you want to do RAID, ZFS is the supported method, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do EXT4 on a single drive. I can always make the second Samsung SSD maybe alternate storage or something like that. And then the obvious question is, well, why am I not using ZFS? There is a ZFS equivalent to RAID 1. Why not use that? And the answer is, well, ZFS isn't always a good option, and it's not a good option in my case. You really need good hard drives for ZFS. Otherwise, you're going to have trouble. And I learned this the hard way on the previous server, the one that this is replacing. And it's not that Samsung SSDs are bad, although some people in home lab really don't like them for some reason. They're really not up to the task when it comes to something like ZFS. It could have something to do with a cache, I'm not really sure. But what'll happen is, is that you'll get all kinds of errors on the drives if you try to use ZFS on these hard drives. So it's better that you don't use that option unless you have maybe something like enterprise hard drives that are up to the task. Again, Samsung SSDs are great, but these particular SSDs, in my experience, don't work well with ZFS. So I'll just go with a single drive for now. I definitely do prefer at least RAID 1 for redundancy, but I do have backups of backups of backups. I'm not really too worried about losing anything. So I'll just install it on the first SSD for now, and then I'll figure out what to do with the other SSD later. So I'll click next. And then we go ahead and configure the time zone, which I'll do right now. Set it to Detroit because that's the closest point to me. And then next. So now it's asking me to set a password for the root user. And I'm just setting it to something simple for now. I'll go ahead and change it later. Then I'll put in my email address here. And I do pay for support with Proxmox, so I definitely want to put in a real email address here. So at this screen, we have the configuration for networking. So that's what I'll set up here. And it auto-selected the first network interface. You know, there's four of them here on the server board. And it's pre-populated the IP address, which can be correct depending. Now in my case, it actually is because this is the IP address right here that I've designated for this Proxmox server. And the reason why it knows this is because my PFSense device actually has a static reservation for this interface already that I've gone ahead and added to that server. And it's actually just defaulting to DHCP right now. So these are the values that it picked up from DHCP. And actually they're all correct except for this one here. I'm going to change this. This is supposed to be the same as the gateway in my case. So basically you just make sure that these values match whatever is for your network environment. And these are the values for mine. So I'll go ahead and click next. And it gives me a little summary here. So I'll click install and then go ahead and let it finish.
And here we are with a successful installation. So let's go ahead and reboot and then I'll log into the new installation and get it set up the rest of the way. So this is awesome. Here we are, we have the server all started and ready to go. So I shouldn't need this anymore. And now what I can do is open a new tab and I can type in the IP address of the new server, but actually what I'm gonna do is type in the host name of the server in my case because PFSense is awesome. But in your case, you could just use the IP address or the DNS name, whatever you use on your network. So in my case, so all I need to do is just type in the URL there. So I don't have SSL or TLS or anything set up yet, so I'll just accept the risk and continue. You can always set that up later. And then here we have the login screen, so go ahead and log in. And it's going to warn me that I don't have a valid subscription, so I actually do have a subscription key that I will add to the server. But for right now, I'm just going to click OK. Then in a new tab, I'm going to open the other Proxmox server. I'll log into this one as well. So now I have both VM servers opened in their own tab. So this right here is the new one that we just set up. And then here's VM host two, which is the other R610 that I have. It has all of my VMs on it right now. And I need to get all of these moved over here to this new server. But before I do that, I need to join the cluster and there's a few things I need to do even before that. Now, first of all, let's check some of the um, resources here. So here on summary, we can see that 0% effectively of 16 CPUs are in use. We get the load average. We can see that the amount of memory that I have is appropriate. And then if I expand this and go to the local LVM, we can see that I have quite a bit of space left here, which is awesome. Then over here on the second node, if I do the same thing and then go to summary, it's not all that different. So here we could see that we have about the same. We have 16 CPUs. There are two eight core processors on this PowerEdge R610. We have about the same amount of RAM. And the CPU we have here is the L5630, like I mentioned earlier in the video. Now on the first server, I made a mistake. I forgot to name the server, and I'm going to go ahead and rename it now. You don't want to do this if you are already in a cluster, but since I haven't joined it yet, I can go ahead and fix the name. So to do that, I'm going to access the shell right here, which will log me right into a terminal. Then what I could do is nano slash Etsy slash hostname then enter. So if you're curious how to rename a node, well, this is how you do it. So I'll give it the appropriate name, the name I should have gave it to begin with. I have my own naming scheme here for the server. So VM host one, this is going to be the primary server. So control O and then enter to save the file and then control X to exit out. And there's one more file I need to edit. It's Etsy hosts. So I'll do that now. And here we have the actual incorrect host name. I'll just go ahead and fix it. Then again at the end here, looks correct to me, so I'll save the file, and then I'll go ahead and reboot the server. I'll give it a moment to come back up, and then see if the name has changed appropriately. And something cool about IPMI, I mean, I could just go here to the remote control and actually see what the current boot progress is, so I don't have to guess. So I just caught the end of the uh, boot screen there, and now it should be starting up, and there it is. Should be ready pretty quick. There we go, we have the correct host name here, so should be able to refresh the page. And there we go, we have the correct name. So I've gone ahead and fixed that. Now the next thing I need to do is make sure that both servers are fully updated. So on VM host two, I'll start with that one because you want them to have all the latest updates when you join the cluster. So I'll refresh. And there's no updates available on the second node. There's definitely going to be updates available on this node. But before I do that, I'm actually going to need to apply my license key to make sure that I get all of the updates. 
So off camera, I have copied my license key, so I'll go down here to subscription. And then it says not found. Well, I haven't added it yet, so I'll upload the key. Paste it in right here and click OK. And it says that it's active, so I should be able to go here to updates and actually get updates. And let's see if it works, so I'll, I'll refresh. It probably won't, and sure enough it didn't, because it does take several minutes for the license to fully activate after you add it. So this is actually normal. It happens every single time. Generally, it seems like I have to wait about five minutes before this starts working. So I'll wait a few more minutes. And even though the license hasn't been fully applied, it already is showing updates here. You do get updates even without a subscription key. There's just a few more additional things and more updates that you get with the subscription key. So I wanna make sure that I'm getting everything. So basically what I do is I just keep clicking refresh over and over again until it works. Um, enough time hasn't passed yet. As we can see here, I'm still erroring out. So I'll give it another moment and then I'll try it again. It looks like this time it's actually working. So that's cool. So it didn't error this time, so I should be able to go ahead and click on upgrade and then enter. It's going to go ahead and install everything and update everything, so I'll go ahead and let this finish. Okay, so that's done. And I'm going to need to reboot for those updates to take effect, but actually there's something I should do first. And I'll scroll back up here to Network. And we have just this one bridge adapter right here. This is the default one that you get when you set up Proxmox, but if I go to the second node and then go to network, you'll see that I actually have two bridges set up here because I have one for the management interface and the other for the VMs. And when I join the cluster, I want all of the networking to match, otherwise I'll have problems. So I need to add the second bridge to the first node. So for that, I'll click create. I'll create a Linux bridge. And the name will default to VMBR and then whatever the number of the other bridge interface was plus one. So VMBR1 in my case for the second bridge. For the IP CIDR, I'm going to give it 10, 10, 10, 0, slash 24. And the bridge port, I'm going to give it the second port right here. So ENO2. Should be good to go. I'm not going to give it a gateway because we already have a gateway on the first interface. So I'll click create. And down here it gives me a list of changes it's going to make. This also needs a reboot, which is why I didn't reboot right after the updates. But now that I have the bridge set up, I can go ahead and do that. So I'll click reboot. Yes, and then I'll let it go. All right, we're ready to go. Refresh just to make sure. And on the network tab here, we do have that other network interface. Everything has been applied successfully. So now the only thing left to do is to join the cluster. Now to do that, I'm going to go here to VM host two because that's already on the cluster. Click up here and then go to cluster. I'll click join information and then copy. And then I'll go over here to the brand new node and do the same thing, go to the same place join cluster, and then I'll simply paste right here. Then click join. And it's often the case that I'll get no output here. I'm not sure if it's a bug. That doesn't mean that the process isn't working, but I usually can click over here on the other node. And sometimes I'll see it down here in the messages. And sure enough, here it is, it says okay. Even though I didn't get a status here, I see the status right here. And we can see that it did actually update successfully, so we should have both nodes, and we do. Now VM host 1 is shown along with VM host 2, even though I'm on the VM host 2 page. And then here on the first one, I should be able to refresh. Log in again. And sure enough, we actually see both nodes here as well. I see all of the VMs running on the second node. 
that I need to move up here to the first node. And you know what, let's go ahead and give that a shot and see if it works. So I'm going to right click this one right here and I'll migrate it. VMhost1 is the target, so migrate again. Let's see if it works. And containers do need to be shut down to migrate. That's normal. So, so far so good. And then I'll also go ahead and migrate this one as well. And it's completed successfully. And we have both of these two nodes right here moved over to the first host. And then I can right click now that I know that it's working and migrate them all with bulk migrate. And let's just do, let's just say three at a time. And then migrate. Let's see what happens. All right. So everything has been moved. All of my VMs are now running on the first node. So let's check out the resources now. And even with all of these VMs running, it's not really using much of the CPU. Honestly, none of these servers are really running any jobs at this time of the day. But we still have plenty of RAM free and plenty of CPU free. So I'm going to figure out what to do with this second node. I might decommission it. I might not even need it anymore. Or I might actually replace it with a similar build, but either way, this project was a complete success. So there you go. That was the build process for my new Proxmox server. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful for you guys. And again, it runs at about 50 watts on average, which is awesome for a virtualization host. I definitely think that this project was successful. One thing I do want to mention, though, is that since the footage was recorded where I built it, I've decided to go a different direction with the hard drive. So in the show notes below, I'm going to have the different model that I decided to go with. I don't know what it was. I tried to use the same SSDs that were in the previous host, the one that this replaces. But I was having some errors, and I'm not really sure if it's a firmware incompatibility or if the drives were just defective. But I did have to replace that. I decided to go with an NVMe drive. But other than that, this server right here, this is the one that I built. The hard drive was the only thing that I changed. It's low power, it's fast, it's awesome. So I hope that was helpful. Again, if you guys have any questions, let me know in the comments below. And if you've built your own home lab server, let me know in the comments below what you decided to go with, what your infrastructure looks like. Let's start a conversation about home lab. And then I'll see you soon in the next video. I have exciting content coming real, real soon. So make sure you subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I'll see you in the next video.